Hi, I'm Joe Vitale, and I'll be the narrator on your adventure through this wonderful material by my friend, Dr. Robert Anthony. In many ways, I am truly stunned that I am recording this wisdom for you. About 15 years ago, I used to study the books by Dr. Robert Anthony. I thought they were works of genius. They helped me more than almost anything else I had read or done at that time in my life. I still regard his book, titled Advanced Formula for Total Success, as a masterpiece. But what really influenced me were a set of tapes from that period. They were called Beyond Positive Thinking. They were written and recorded by Dr. Robert Anthony. I remember studying and discussing the concepts in them with friends of mine. We all marveled at what we were learning. This material truly revealed the secrets of the universe. But life went on, and I lost track of the books, the tapes, and Dr. Robert Anthony. I moved a few times, went through a divorce, wrote books of my own, recorded material of my own, and went on my merry way to create my own success in the world. I had pretty much forgotten Dr. Robert Anthony, though studying his work had installed in me the mindset for success that helped me become the person I am today. And then one day something shocking happened to me. I opened my email and there was a message from someone calling himself Dr. Robert Anthony. I couldn't believe it. I thought he had died. As it turned out, he was alive and well, now living in Australia, and in fact was a great admirer of my best-selling book, Spiritual Marketing. Now, you have to imagine how shocked I was to hear all this. The man I studied 15 years ago is now in my life, telling me he loves my books. Not only that, but he wanted to co-author a book with me. Wow! And we did just that. We released the ebook Spiritual Marketing in Action, just a few weeks ago. You can read about it online at www.spiritualmarketinginaction.com. But all of that isn't even the juicy part to this story. After hearing from Dr. Anthony, co-authoring a book with him, and later even meeting him when we both ended up in Las Vegas a few months ago, he then proceeded to stun me even further by telling me that the book of his I love so much, Advanced Formula for Total Success, was actually based on his famous tape set, Beyond Positive Thinking. He then told me the book was out of print and the tapes were out of print, but that he had updated all of the material and wanted to record a new and improved version of his best work. And then he asked me to be the one to record it for him. Can you believe it? Ah, oh, life is a series of miracles, isn't it? So here I am, Joe Vitale, sitting in a recording studio in Austin, Texas, about to read for you the greatest self-help wisdom of all time, Dr. Robert Anthony's Beyond Positive Thinking. This is the material that changes lives and finally shows people how to achieve miracles in their lives. This is the material people used to love so much they would buy multiple copies of the recordings and give them to friends and family. This is the material that changed my life. This is Beyond Positive Thinking. Let's get started. You are about to partake on a journey that could profoundly change your life. In this material, I will offer you a no-nonsense, practical way to create anything you desire. Everything you are about to learn is based on proven psychological and metaphysical techniques and timeless principles for success. Do these techniques and principles really work? I respect your intelligence more than just to tell you that they work and then expect you to believe me. The only proof that these techniques and principles work is the results you will experience if you use them. I can tell you about them, but nothing will be as convincing as using them and seeing your own results. We have all purchased self-help books, audio programs, and taken seminars that were supposed to improve our performance and change our lives. After completing them, we were highly motivated and even made temporary changes, only to find that within a few days or a few weeks, we were right back to where we were before. Why? because they did not show us how to make permanent and lasting changes. The solutions are often like putting frosting on a spoiled cake. No matter how good the frosting looks, we have to deal with what's underneath the frosting. The frosting is positive thinking, and the cake is our unworkable beliefs that keep us from producing positive results. 
This material is about producing positive results. It's about taking our ideas and dreams and turning them into reality. If you are looking for an inspirational recording with light doses of positive thinking laced with colorful case histories that take up valuable time and space, this is not the recording for you. However, if you are looking for a no-nonsense methodology that goes beyond positive thinking, then this material will be of great value to you. You have in your hands a proven formula for success that will enable you to go beyond positive thinking to produce the results you desire. It will require a commitment on your part, but in the end, it will be worth every minute you invest in this study. I feel privileged to have the opportunity to share this information with you. Now, if you are ready, let's get started on our journey. Positive thinking, negative thinking, right thinking. The starting point of making permanent and lasting changes in your life begins with understanding the difference between positive thinking, negative thinking, and right thinking. Think of the person who sits down to play the piano. As he plays, there is no harmony, no balance, and no real tune because he keeps hitting all the wrong notes. The player eventually gets fed up with this disharmony, lack of pleasure, and lack of beauty in his music, and decides to go get a teacher. The teacher says, you have the ability to play, but you need to understand music. Each of us has the ability to play the game of life with balance, harmony, and joy, but we need to know the rules and the principles. What we want to do here is to work on recognizing, remembering, and using the principles to improve the quality of our lives. Life works according to principle and physical law. If it didn't, you couldn't fly an airplane because there would be no gravity, there would be no such thing as electricity, and one plus one would not equal two. The laws of the universe must be totally dependable. Universal law is not only dependable, but also unchangeable. You can depend on it, and it will work every time. In essence, the universe will never let you down. It doesn't care how old you are, how young you are, how short, how fat, how skinny, your religion, your nationality, or whether you are a male or a female. The power, the force, or the energy is neutral, and we direct it through our own ideas and beliefs. What we are saying is that your word is the law in the universe. But you need to know these laws. Without an understanding of the laws, through ignorance, you cannot create what you want. The fundamental law to which all other laws conform is the law of cause and effect. The law of cause and effect says that the effect or result of any situation must be equal to the cause. The cause is always an idea or belief. Another way of describing the law of cause and effect is the example of sowing and reaping, or action and reaction, or, put in a modern-day context, my ideas are created into my results. The law of cause and effect is impersonal, just like sunshine. If you are standing in the sun, you receive the warmth and healing benefits of the sun's rays. If you are standing in the shade, it seems like the sun isn't shining on you. But who moved you into the shade? Who moved you into the darkness? The truth is, we are in darkness because of our ignorance. I repeat, the law of cause and effect is impersonal. This is why we can see so many people who are basically good have so many problems and disasters in their lives. Somewhere in their life, that person has misused or misunderstood the law. It doesn't mean that he or she is bad. It doesn't mean that he or she isn't a loving person. It means that through ignorance or misunderstanding, that person has misused the law. This can be applied to any natural law. For instance, aerodynamics or gravity will not kill you, but a misunderstanding of its function will, even if you are a kind, loving, positive person. The universe is like a river. The river keeps on flowing. It doesn't care whether you are happy or sad, good or bad. It just keeps flowing. Some people go down to the river and they cry. Some people go down to the river and they are happy. But the river doesn't care. It just keeps flowing. We can use it and enjoy it, or we can jump in and drown. The river just keeps flowing because it is impersonal. 
And so it is with the universe. The universe that we live in can support us or destroy us. It's our interpretation and use of the laws that determine our effects or results. We can only receive what our minds are capable of accepting. We can go to the river of life with a teaspoon and someone else may go with a cup. Someone else may go with a bucket and yet another person may go with a barrel. But the abundance of the river is always there and waiting. Our consciousness, our ideas, our frame of reference, and our belief system determine whether we go to the river of life with a teaspoon, a cup, a bucket, or a barrel. If we are impoverished in our thinking and have gone to the river of life with only a teaspoon, we may curse the little we have in our teaspoon. We may curse others who have more than we do. But remember, whatever we curse, in effect, curses us. The river is there, and it's overflowing with abundance. We can come to the river of life with a teaspoon, a bucket, or a barrel any time we want to. What we take from the river of life is up to us. The only limitation is in our own mind. The truth is, we can have anything we want if we'll give up the belief that we can't have it. It's as simple as that. All our experiences have led us to believe certain things about ourselves. Whether these beliefs are true or not really doesn't matter because if we accept them as true, then they are true for us. If we speak our word long enough, it becomes law in the universe. Pronounce your limitations vigorously enough and they're yours. Whether your beliefs are true or totally insane, if you accept them, then that's what your life will be about. Once we have accepted an idea, it's an idea whose time has come and there is nothing that can stop it. If we accepted an idea of lack and limitation, it is an idea whose time has come for us. There is nothing that we can do about it except to change our mind. If you plant a seed, it is going to grow. If you plant a tomato, you will have a tomato. The tomato won't change its mind and become a cucumber because it thinks a cucumber is better for you. The soil will give you tomatoes as long as you keep planting them, even if you are allergic to tomatoes. Look at the beliefs that form the groundwork of your life. We are full of beliefs that we have collected over the years. Attitudes, ideas, opinions, and conditioning. And we are so full of what we know that when challenged, we dig in our heels and often think, Don't tell me anything new. I have my beliefs together, and how dare you try to change them. This is what I've based my whole life on. Now you are telling me I could be wrong. I don't want to hear that. So we live with a set of beliefs called religion, a set of beliefs called politics, a set of beliefs about ourselves, a set of beliefs about the kind of people that we like or don't like, and a set of beliefs about everything else. Many of the things that we believe, garnered from experience, groups of people, or individuals, are not true, but they are the things that we have imagined to be true out of our need to survive. Because the will to survive and the desire for order are strong, we create rules about the nature of life and how it unfolds, and these rules become beliefs. Unfortunately, those beliefs can also become limitations. The fact of the matter is, we can only be successful to the degree that we are willing to shed our mistaken beliefs. When we experience sickness, failure, or lack, it is often because of the limitations in our own mind. The sad thing is, even though we know our lives aren't working in certain areas, we are still afraid to change. We are locked into our comfort zone, no matter how self-destructive it may be. Yet, the only way to get out of our comfort zone and to be free of our problems and limitations is to get uncomfortable. We can only experience freedom in direct proportion to the amount of truth that we're willing to accept without running away. We must stop kidding ourselves, stop blaming others, and stop avoiding unpleasant decisions, and start facing the truth that we may have accepted unworkable beliefs that are the direct cause of the events in our lives. It is not a question of going from negative thinking to positive thinking. It is a matter of moving toward right thinking, which means moving toward knowing the absolute truth about who we are and our relationship to life. Right thinking, which is based in truth and not illusion, is the foundation that determines the solidity of all other thinking. Positive thinking and negative thinking are both filtered through our belief system. 
Right thinking comes from being aware of the truth or the reality of any situation. Always seek to know the truth about any situation in which you are involved. Look behind your present belief system and ask your higher self, what is the truth about this? Your higher self will always reveal the truth to you if you are ready to hear it. When you act upon that truth, you are using right thinking. It's not a matter of being positive or negative, but simply being yourself. And when you are yourself, which means you're allowing your higher self to reveal the truth, every situation you are involved in will resolve itself perfectly. This might sound magical, but it is only the law of cause and effect in action. Of the terms that describe man's difficulty, the term self-defeating is perhaps the most accurate. The aim of all great teachers was to awaken men and women to their self-defeating behavior. People say they want to grow up, assume life's responsibilities, but most of the time what they really want to do is remain a child. They are not willing to change. Instead, they give reasons or excuses as to why they can't be, do, or have what they want. The way out of this is to start by eliminating excuses. If we believe that someone or something outside of ourselves is the cause of our problem, we will always look outside of ourselves for the solution. In order to find the true answers to our problems, we must begin by looking at ourselves in a new way, which will cause us to see people and events in a new way. The outer world is in many ways a reproduction of our inner world. Realize this. How many troubled people do you know who have not given the slightest attention to this fact? No amount of determination, no amount of willpower, inspiration, or motivation will solve our problems if we look outside of ourselves for the answer. The mind attracts whatever is familiar to itself. The frightened mind attracts frightening experiences. A confused mind attracts more confusion. This phenomenon is the principle by which animals are attracted to their own kind. The subconscious mind, which is the prover, will always prove you are right. If you believe that you can't be, do, or have something, you will create the circumstances and find the people to prove that you can't. For example, thinking that you are a fat person will keep you fat. You may lose weight and override the belief, but as soon as you relax and are off guard, your subconscious will take over and automatically support your belief that you are a fat person again. Remember, the job of the subconscious is to prove that your belief is correct. It functions like the automatic pilot of an airplane. If the autopilot is set to go east, you can manually override the controls and go north. But as soon as you let go, the automatic pilot, which has been programmed to go east, will control the plane and you will fly east. Your subconscious does not change the reality of the world around you. It just filters the information that you present to it in order to support your beliefs or the picture that you hold in your mind. If you believe that business is bad, or that there are no new opportunities for your business, your subconscious will not point out new opportunities or direct you in ways to improve your present business. This would be a violation of the principle of mind. It will only point out problems that support your belief that things are bad or that there are no new opportunities. Your subconscious cannot think for itself. It will draw to you only those things that are consistent with your deepest inner beliefs, nothing more, nothing less. If you do not know this is truth and do not realize that you create your potential out of your ideas, you will feel powerless to affect change. You will feel that you are the victim of people, circumstances, and conditions. If you accept yourself as powerless, you will imagine that the only way to get what you want is to get it from another person or an organization. You will look to something or someone outside of yourself to fulfill your desires. When you come to the understanding that everything that you want can be created through your mind, through the use of right thinking, which is simply clear thinking, you come to the realization that only you can give yourself what you want. To create what you want, you have to trust the power within you. Now, when you are told to trust the power within you, immediately you could say, 
Look at the starvation. Look at the sickness, the war, and the crime in the world. You are telling me to trust the power? If this power existed, why would it allow this to happen? Well, the truth is, it doesn't allow anything to happen. Remember, we said the power is neutral. It is simply the power of creation. It is the impersonal force of life. We can use this power or life force to create anything that we want in our lives. Even if we choose from ignorance, it doesn't matter. It will support us in our ignorance until we learn from it. The effect will always be equal to the cause. If we're in a ditch, it means the power is supporting us in being in a ditch. If our life is immensely successful, it means that the power supports us in our success. It all comes out of our ideas. We said earlier that our ideas are created into our results. To put it another way, it is done unto you as you believe, not as you want, but as you believe. There is a vast difference between the two. When you think, the universe moves. This means that when you put an idea out into the universe, people, places, and things come into your life to fulfill that idea. When we think, we actually cause things to happen. Look at what this power has done in the universe. Look all around you and see all the marvelous creations, infinite in number. The best news of all is that same power is within you. And the more open, responsive, and receptive we are to this power, the more fulfilling and magnificent our lives will be. If this is true, then how does the power work? You and I are indirect users of the power. Let me explain. When you started your car today, what did you have to do? Well, you had to turn your key, which turned a small starting motor, which in turn started the engine. The starter motor was powered by electricity. Now, what was the direct source of that electricity? Was it the battery? No, it wasn't. A battery is not an independent source. It has to be charged up. Your higher self is essentially a battery within that receives its source of power or energy from the universe. It then stores that power for you to use for the purpose of creation. In science, we have Ohm's law, which states that C equals E divided by R. C equals the amount of electrical energy that is available for your appliance at the place where you're going to plug it in. For example, C equals the amount of electricity to run your toaster. The power to run the appliance is the result of E, which is the direct power source, divided by R, which is the resistance the power meets while getting there. Now, suppose the main power line coming into the building where you live is 750,000 volts, but it comes into your house at 110 to 220 volts to run your appliances. To do this, transformers are used on the power line to reduce the power coming into your house to make it safe for application. This is just like the power available to you. You have the ultimate power of the universe available to you, but it also has infinite wisdom, which might be referred to as a transformer. While our higher self is plugged into the ultimate power of the universe, this power also has enough wisdom to put some transformers in between to insulate it so we don't get too much before we are ready for it and burn ourselves out. Now, if you wanted to bring in more power, what would you do? Well, you would create less resistance, and you would change the wiring to accommodate the additional flow of power. This power is like the water in our earlier example in the sense that a larger container is needed to carry greater quantities. You cannot expect that just because your higher self is plugged into the ultimate power, intelligence and wisdom of the universe, that you can just turn it on because if you did, you would blow yourself right out. So in order to get our lives to work and take greater advantage of this energy, we have to build a bigger channel for creative intelligence to flow through. To enlarge this channel, we have to expand our consciousness. Expanding our consciousness involves expanding our ideas and beliefs about ourselves and our relationship to this power. And as we do this, we begin to experience more of this ultimate power, and our ability to create greatly increases. You and I are creative beings, and we always have the capacity to create more. 
In fact, we are always creating, consciously or unconsciously, by knowing who we are and the process by which we can expand the power within, we can begin to move our creation from the unconscious to the conscious. When we begin to create on the conscious level, we can now make choices. When we can make choices, we're no longer the victim of our unconscious reactions, which are determined by our past experiences, conditioning, and outmoded beliefs. If our thoughts do not support what we want, rather than trying to eliminate our negative thinking, all we have to do is center on right thinking and concentrate on the belief system at work. Right thinking is the thinking that is based on truth, and it is right because it will support us in what we are trying to achieve. Your higher self always knows what is best for you. All you need to do in the beginning is to know that you want something better than you have right now. Just keep that thought. Never settle down into self-satisfaction because there is no growth without discontent. While it is important to live in the present moment and accept what is, it is also important to grow from where we are. Study your dissatisfaction very carefully because it will tell you something about yourself. Your life is an ever-changing canvas. What are you going to paint on it? Are you going to paint lack and limitation? Because if you do, your canvas is going to reflect lack and limitation. Have you ever gone to the circus and noticed that the great big elephants are tied to a wooden stake with just a thin rope? Also, the baby elephants have a big chain around their legs that is tied to a long metal stake that goes deep into the ground. This happens because the baby elephants must be chained up when they are very tiny to keep them from trying to get away. If the stake is driven far enough into the ground and the chain is strong enough, the baby elephant won't be able to budge. Eventually the day will come when the baby elephant stops tugging and never again tries to pull away. Someone then replaces the metal stake with a wooden one because they know the elephant has been conditioned to believe that he cannot get away. By creating our own limitation through our belief system, we do the very same thing. We become limited not by reality, but by reality as we perceive it to be. I once had a cat that seemed to believe that he couldn't jump onto high places, so he wouldn't even try. As the cat got older, he grew senile and simply forgot he didn't know how to jump. One day I came home and the cat was sitting on the highest shelf on the bookcase. He had knocked over all the books and art objects. You see, in the cat's senility, he forgot what he couldn't do. What would happen if we became senile in a positive way? We would quite possibly forget all the things that we can't do and just do them. Understand that if your life does not work the way you want it to, it is because you have accepted false beliefs that keep you from being all that you can be. Unfortunately, the majority of people on this planet feel stuck. When we look at the world and see the suffering, misery, and impoverishment, when we see so many well-intentioned people doing without, the world looks insane. We see people giving up, believing that they have to take from others in order to have anything for themselves. Rarely do we look within for the answer to this confusion. Rarely does the individual really look to see what the rules of life are. So what happens is that in our ignorance of ourselves and of life, we hassle, fight, and strain to get what we want and it ends up not working anyway. You see, life is a game. Some people play the game of struggle. Some people play the game of sickness. Some people play the game of poverty. Some people play the game of being right all the time. Some people play the game of being late. But some people play the game of happiness, abundance, and health. It just helps to understand that each individual plays a game that he or she sets up and that no one game is necessarily better than another. If the game was not bringing us some sort of a payoff, we'd stop playing. Look at your own life. Try to see the secret satisfaction that you get out of not being fully in charge of your life. What kind of secret satisfaction could there possibly be in feeling victimized? How could anyone enjoy feeling weak or poor or inadequate? Well, the answer is in the payoff or pay value. For example, if you play the weak game, 
Others will have to love you, take care of you, and protect you. It is the ultimate way to get attention. If you play the game of being undecided all the time and let other people decide for you, then you are protected from blame if you make a mistake. In other words, if you keep both hands tied behind you, then you can expect someone to take care of you. In playing the helpless routine, you are actually controlling others. The power of powerless people is remarkable. They are good at making others play the part that they have written for them. Look at the value that you are getting out of your payoff. An example is being sick. Look at the value you get out of being sick. You may be saying, that is insensitive and cruel. You don't know what I've been through. No, it's not cruel. It's crueler to deny it. What you are really saying is that your disease has more power than you do to decide your destiny. The question here is, who is giving the illness such power? If you are experiencing illness, just take a look at it. Don't pass any judgment on yourself. Just let it tell you something. Know that no matter what is going on in your body, it begins in your mind. Illness is the body's reaction to your mind. Since your body is a feedback mechanism of your mind, it will always let you know what is going on in your consciousness and at an emotional level. Let your body be your teacher. It's interesting in our society that it is totally okay to spend $50,000 on a heart attack, but what would people say if you spent that amount of money on just having fun? They would think you were crazy, and they would probably resent you. It seems we have our priorities mixed up. Perhaps if we spent $50,000 on having fun, we wouldn't have so many heart attacks. Think about it. Having pleasure is abnormal, but having pain is normal. Why are we waiting to be healthy, to be happy, to be alive, to be wealthy, to start a new business, to fall in love, to communicate, to clear up the relationships we are in? Waiting is a trap. We wait for interest rates to go down, for the economy to get better, for a person to change, for the holiday to pass before starting a diet. But there will always be a reason to wait. The truth is, however, that we can only have two things in life, reasons or results, and reasons don't count. I knew a beautiful, intelligent young woman who had everything to live for and yet tried to kill herself several times with alcohol and drugs. Do you know why? She always felt some quality of life to be missing and didn't know she could create her life the way she wanted. Instead, she was waiting for someone to bring her happiness to her. But that miraculous person never showed up. This desire to have other people provide our happiness, or the belief that we can provide others happiness, accounts for an endless procession of social schemes and organized drives for a better world. Man's major illusion is that he can build a society that functions on a higher psychological and spiritual level than what he presently knows. Many people urge us to work for a better society or a better world. This is a great error. Since we cannot create anything higher than our own level of understanding, society as a whole doesn't get much better. Society's systems for social change can only add a new burden on top of an old burden. Our overwhelmed mind has no idea what to do with all the social schemes thrust upon us. But in our desperation to make things better, it forces us to try to make sense out of nonsense. The problem is that we're trying to right the world's wrongs from the outside in. We attempt to reform the outside world by forcing outer conditions to change. Unfortunately, this outside-in approach is doomed to failure because we are dealing with the effect instead of the cause. We need to remind ourselves and every individual on this planet that we can and must change the world from the inside out. We have overwhelming proof that the outside-in approach does not work. The long-term solution to poverty, lack, and limitation lies in our ability to turn our inner potential into reality. The only way we can truly heal the world is to heal ourselves first. We can't look around us for help. We have to look within. This is not a new message, but I think we need to remind ourselves of who we are and what we are capable of. We need to take responsibility for everything that has happened to us. 
Through the law of attraction, we attract either consciously or unconsciously everything that happens to us. Whatever anyone has done to us, we have participated in it and are at some level responsible. In essence, there are no victims, only volunteers. This is a hard pill to swallow, but lest we accept it, we cannot change things for the better. It seems we are a culture of blamers. If your wristwatch shows the wrong time, what do you do about it? Well, you wouldn't ask your neighbor to set their watch according to yours. You'd correct your watch. Unfortunately, we do not make similar corrections when our lives are not working. Instead, we insist that reality should conform to our illusion. Your unlimited power lies in your ability to control your thoughts. A confused mind works in the direction of sickness, poverty, lack, and limitation, rather than in the direction of abundance, health, and success. If we are not creating our lives the way we want them to be, we are creating from our unconscious. But since life is consciousness, the most important task we have is the development of the highest possible consciousness. We can do this by looking at the conditions of our lives and challenging our beliefs, even if our egos are threatened. Whenever we want something in our lives, we must let go of anything that is between us and that consciousness. In your heart, you know exactly what you want. And if you will listen to your intuition, it will tell you. Your mind will sell you out, but your intuition never will. Your intuition is your connection with the ultimate power. Learn to trust it. People can control you through your mind, but they can never control you through your intuition. We imagine we will lose something by following our intuition. But have you ever taken a look at what you have lost by not following your intuition? Whatever your intuition is telling you is what you need to hear. As you learn to trust it more and more, it will reveal exactly what you need to do at any given moment. Your life is important. It is important to you, and it is important to the rest of the people on this planet. I believe that every person on this planet arrived here with a mission. If you will listen to your intuition, your purpose or your mission will be revealed to you. The Truth About You if you want to take control of your life, it's important that you gain a basic understanding of who you are. Our self-image, which is the picture of ourselves that we hold in our minds, becomes the key to our lives. All our actions, feelings, and behavior, and even our abilities, are consistent with this formed picture. We literally act out the kind of person that we think that we are. What we need to be aware of is that as long as we hold on to that picture, no amount of willpower, effort, determination, or commitment will cause us to be any other way, because we're always going to act the way we see ourselves. To be any other way, we must first look at how we form our self-image. From birth onward, we collect hundreds of ideas about ourselves as being good or bad, wise or stupid, confident or fearful, and so on. Through repetition, these often false identities harden into our self-image. This self-image either allows us to be happy and successful, or it tyrannizes our lives. Whether we realize it or not, within ourselves is a mental blueprint. It's a picture of the way that we think that we are. This blueprint is exact and complete down to the last detail. This summary or blueprint is our self-image. However, this blueprint is not who we are, but rather who we think we are. The circumstances or conditions that formed our self-image may have been totally erroneous or blown out of proportion, but as far as we are concerned, it's all true. Once we record this information, we do not question its validity. Most of the time we can't even consciously recall how or where we obtained this information. We just live as though it were true. Even if it's not true, we believe it's true. 
The vast majority have missed the message that all the great teachers since the beginning of recorded history have tried to share with their fellow human beings. The secret of the ages, the one most incredible truth that very few realize, is that at the being level, which we will call your higher self, you are spiritually whole, complete, and perfect. Just as a drop of water has all the qualities of the ocean, you have all the qualities of the Creator within you. Science, philosophy, and religion all teach in their own way that there's ultimately one power in the universe, and that we're one with that power, energy, force, or whatever you're comfortable with. You and I are individualized expressions of all the power of the universe. This can be called your higher self. We can never destroy the higher self within us. We can deny that it's there, we can try to hide from it, we can lie about it, but ultimately we cannot change the fact that it's who we are. What we need to do is to recognize that it is who we are and learn how to channel it through our thoughts. We must understand the distinction between who we are and what we do. Who we are is spiritually perfect, but what we do is not always perfect. The gap between who we are and what we do is created through ignorance. When we don't know that we are spiritually perfect, it follows that our actions will be less than perfect. I'd like you to do something right now. Just say to yourself, I know that who I am is spiritually perfect. Now listen to the little voice in your head. It's probably saying, oh no, I'm not. The affirmation of perfection seriously threatens your ego. Your ego immediately sends back the response, What do you mean you're perfect? Come on now, take a good look at yourself. Look at the way you treat other people. Remember what you did yesterday? You're always complaining. How about the way you treat your mother, your father, your boss, your mate? How about the way you treat yourself? And remember that terrible thing you did back in 1986? How can you say you are spiritually perfect after that? Take a good look at yourself and stop this nonsense. You see, your ego does not want you to take a good look at yourself. It wants you to take a bad look at yourself. It wants you to identify with everything that you're not. It wants you to identify with your actions and feel guilty. It wants you to judge, condemn, and blame yourself for not living up to the pictures and expectations of yourself and others. To get out of this trap, simply recognize that it's just your ego trying to trick you. This is not the truth about you. All of this is coming from your conditioning. The way out of this is to affirm your own perfection. It's not an ego trip to affirm your own perfection. It's an ego trip not to affirm your own perfection. Remember, the first and most essential step in changing your life, no matter what you want to be, do, or have, is to realize your own perfection based upon the truth about you, that you are spiritually whole, complete, and perfect. The way to neutralize your ego is to love yourself unconditionally. Loving yourself doesn't bloat your ego. Loving yourself actually neutralizes your ego, because your ego isn't about loving yourself. We need to understand that life is consciousness. This means that what we assume to be true will become real for us. Whatever we're conscious of, we will experience. In essence, we will experience in life what we're deeply convinced is so. This statement is important. We experience in life what we're deeply convinced is so. If our thought patterns say, I cannot have this or that, I don't deserve this or that, I'm a bad person, we continue to create conditions that correspond to our ideas of evil, lack, and limitation. The bottom line is this. If we cannot accept ourselves that we're worthy and deserving, then we cannot accept that other people are worthy and deserving and will therefore be in judgment of them. The solution is to develop unconditional love of ourselves and others. This is the only way that we can ever be free. We must have total acceptance of ourselves first and then others, knowing that as we are spiritually perfect, so is everyone else.
In a very important way, you've created yourself whether you know it or not. All the character traits, mannerisms, ways of talking, ways of walking, facial expressions, gestures, and even ways of thinking and believing, you have borrowed, imitated, or made your own. It may have been from a parent or others in the household, a favorite teacher, a friend, or a character in a book or a movie. Maybe you borrowed from someone you didn't even like. It may have been from someone who made you feel uncomfortable or afraid. Imitating that person could have been a way of making you feel less afraid and a way of intimidating others. It's important to take a look at the personality that you've created. Perhaps one of the reasons you keep yourself from doing this is because you've been an imitator. It's not uncommon to get hung up on this. It may help to understand that nobody, but nobody, can create a self from scratch. Everyone has to do the same thing. Everybody chooses from what's available. Even though you may have built your personality through imitation, you're not a fraud. No one else has ever put together the exact same combination that you have. Don't forget, there are only 12 notes in the musical scale, and yet many hundreds of thousands of unique and beautiful combinations are created. It's all a matter of how they are put together. It doesn't make you any less of a unique person to have taken from others. The wonderful thing about this is that since you put it together from scratch, you can change it at any time you want to. You're never stuck. It's not a disaster to discover that you're not the person that you thought you were. On the contrary, it's the beginning of the end of disaster. In order to change the experiences that are causing you pain and disharmony, it's necessary to begin with a clear understanding that you never help yourself by rejecting any part of yourself. We get into self-hatred because we set up a picture of how we think we should be based on the conditioning from our family, peer groups, mate, and religion, and the society that we live in. The sad part of this is that we'll never be able to live up to the pictures, images, models, standards, or concepts of how we think we should be. It's a psychological dead end. We've allowed our ego to trick us into believing that we're incompetent, inadequate, insecure, stupid, bad, evil, and unworthy. All of this can be summed up as poor self-esteem and a poor self-image. Until we make a conscious decision to change our thought patterns, we will continue to have poor self-esteem and a poor self-image. The first and most important thing in your life is self-acceptance, to love who you are. To be yourself. Only when you love yourself can you begin to love others. Many people say that you should forget about yourself and love others first. Well, it doesn't work that way. The truth is, you must first accept yourself with all your mistakes, all of your so called sins, all the times you looked like a fool, and all the times you've acted inappropriately. You must be able to stand before the entire world and make no excuse for yourself. When you can do that, you're coming from a position of unconditional love. How you see yourself creates your behavior, and this behavior creates your environment or your results. When you attach your self-worth to your accomplishments or to your behavior, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. No matter how hard you try, someone is going to think you're not okay. Remember this. You'll always be a failure in someone's eyes. You'll never win them all over, sometimes not even a majority. Take a look at how much of your life is about winning approval and realize this important truth. You'll never get it. You simply can't please everyone, so learn to please yourself and enjoy who you are. It's worth repeating that who you are is spiritually perfect. But what you do is not always perfect. What you do may succeed or fail. But you can detach yourself from the results by remembering that you can never be a success or a failure based on what you have and what you do. There's no way that you can fail in life as a person. You're not set up that way. When you're into hating yourself for all the things that you've done or haven't done, or into hating other people for what they haven't given you, you're into suffering. Suffering is a way of putting yourself down. It's a way of being angry at yourself. 
If you really get down to it, anger and suffering and lack of happiness in our lives comes from being disappointed in ourselves for not living up to some expectation that we have of ourselves or that someone else has of us. In working with alcoholics and prisoners, I have found that the major cause of their situation is self-hatred. Their self-hatred stemmed from the fact they hadn't lived up to someone else's expectations. Most of us judge ourselves on the basis of what we have or don't have and what we've accomplished or what we haven't. We feel that when we are a failure, we've let ourselves and others down. When we don't come up to the expectations of our parents, employers, religion, friends, or mate, we conclude that we're no good, and this is known as self-judgment. When you're standing in judgment of yourself, you will judge yourself as bad. And as soon as you put yourself down for something that you have or haven't done, or something that did not work out, or for a situation where you disappointed someone else, you feel bad. Yet this type of judgment only serves to carve away at what little self-esteem you have. It never does any good. It only destroys. It's true that each and every one of us has things in our lives that we regret. But at some point, we have to stop dwelling on the regret and move on. We have to learn the lesson and throw away the experience. We can never be for anyone as long as we are against ourselves. To be against others is to be against ourselves. This is a spiritual and psychological truth. The most corrupt thing that we can do is to judge someone. To suppress another individual and take away another's aliveness is one of the most negative and self-destructive behaviors a person can have. What would happen if you had no regrets of the past? Try to image what would happen if you totally forgave everyone in your life regardless of what they did to you. Hopefully you are beginning to see that to the degree that you cannot forgive, whether it be yourself or someone else, you perpetuate unhappiness, poverty, sickness, lack, and limitation in your life. Many people don't want to forgive others. They say things like, why should I let them off the hook after what they did to me? The enemy is always someone we think can harm us or take something away from us. But the truth is, no one can harm us. People harm us through ourselves. Actually, they don't harm us at all. We give them instructions on how to treat us, and they just follow through. Make a decision to give up all resentment right now, because in the end, it will eventually destroy you. Yes, you say, I agree with you, but you don't know my circumstances. They really did hurt me. I'll give up my resentment next week, but I have a little more getting even to do. Understand that this type of mentality is more destructive to you than it is to the person that you resent. Turn your attention to this idea. You cannot be wealthy if you resent wealthy people. If you resent talented or beautiful people, you cannot be talented or beautiful. If you resent thin people, you cannot be thin. Whatever you resent is a statement of what you lack. When you resent, you cannot be healed, because through your resentment, you literally cause your own sickness. Remember, whoever you resent is you, because we're all one. The more you love and support other people in being who they are, the more you will have of everything. Rather than resent people who have what you don't have, or do what you can't do, take the time to learn from these people. Be with masters. Be with people who know how life works. Admire them, acknowledge them, and support them in having what they have. And as you do that, you actually support yourself in having what you want. If you study philosophy and religion, you will see that values, morals, and principles are often rooted in the belief that something is better than something else. A is better than B. Don't get caught in the trap. Forget about the way you think something should be done or how someone wants you to do it. Instead, just be yourself and do it the way you feel it should be done. About 700 years ago, a great teacher ripe with years and honors lay dying. His students and disciples asked if he was afraid to die. Yes, he said, I am afraid to meet my maker. But how can that be, the students and disciples responded. You have lived such an exemplary life. You led us out of the wilderness like Moses. You have judged between us wisely like Solomon. 
Softly he replied, When I meet my Maker, he will not ask, Have you been Moses or Solomon? He will ask, Have you been yourself? The story shows that throughout time, people have struggled to be themselves. Why are we still struggling? The struggle comes out of our need to please others. By assuming your own destiny, you're bound to get someone angry, your boss, your spouse, your parents, your children, but in time they will adjust. At first, assuming your own destiny can be a lonely process, and it may seem that everyone is against you. But the only image you must live up to is your own. The opinions of those who can cheer you on or hold you back are irrelevant. The decision to live your life is your own responsibility. The results of your own life are your own responsibility. Your action or inaction becomes your own responsibility. Some people's conditioning and beliefs are in conflict with yours, and when they see someone living in opposition to their values and beliefs, it can be very frightening for them because, in a way, it threatens their own foundations. They feel that if you're right, they're going to have to give up some of their own beliefs and change. When a person is confronted with your beliefs, there's an inner battle that's waged, and the battle is... Could they possibly be right? And if they are, that means I could be wrong. A person who knows who they are and loves himself or herself unconditionally is not threatened by the beliefs of others. It all goes back to developing a high level of self-esteem. Let me ask you, do you like yourself? Do you trust yourself? Do you keep promises that you make to yourself? Do you think that you're a good person? Are you yourself most of the time, or have you developed an act to cover up who you are? If you had a friend who treated you like you treat yourself, or talked to you the way that you talk to yourself, and broke commitments to you the way that you break commitments to yourself, do you think you'd keep them as a friend? Let's face it, you probably wouldn't want that type of person around. It's very important to take a look at the way we treat ourselves. Most of the time, we are our own worst enemy. We are afraid to meet our inner selves because we think we may not like what we see. A person says, I want to explore myself, but I'm afraid of what I'm going to find out about myself. I'm afraid of the strange creatures that I may find along the way or along the journey. Understand this clearly. It is absolutely impossible for the truth about yourself to cause fear. No matter how terrible the truth may be, it is powerless in itself to either frighten or harm you. Fear is caused by resistance to the truth and by misunderstanding it. Start your journey of self-discovery at once. Nothing but good can come from it. The understanding of fear cures fear. Don't get hung up on the kind of person that you think that you are. Don't concern yourself with whether you're better or worse than other people. Instead, try to know yourself as the kind of person that you are. If you look at a half-finished house that you're building, you don't condemn it for its unfinished condition. You don't say it's inferior to another house, nor are you concerned with its appearances. All you do is realize its need for additional work. Adopt this way of thinking toward yourself. Whatever your present condition, just realize the need for more construction. Be patient with yourself, but be firm toward the necessary work that needs to be done. When you're an expert on yourself, you're an expert on everyone else. A conscious person knows himself. He knows his own nature, and therefore he knows everything about other people who have the same nature. Know yourself as you are, and you will know others as they are. Never be afraid to expose a weakness in yourself. Exposing a weakness is the beginning of strength. Remember, everything you learn about yourself is good news. No matter how difficult or surprising it may be, it's always good news. Keep this in mind, especially in times when a new truth clashes with a belief that you know you must abandon but are reluctant to do so. A wise person is willing to give up a pebble in exchange for a diamond. Have the courage to do this, and self-change begins. Self-worth comes from self. That's why it's not called other-worth. 
If your worth comes from others, you'll never love yourself. You don't have to have permission from others to change your life. Don't ask, is this right for me to go against everything that I've been taught to believe? Instead say, let me see how much intensity I can put into my search. Your own desire for personal freedom is the only search warrant you will ever need. If you're really going to learn the truth about you and live your life as you're capable of living, a lot of people aren't going to like it because they're not committed to the same path as you are. Are you going to deny yourself riches because others are poor? Are you going to deny yourself health because millions of people are sick? Take a good look at what you're denying yourself and don't ever think of yourself as wrong for wanting what you want. As we move along the path of self-discovery, we're bound to make mistakes. Those so-called mistakes, faults, sins, or errors are not you. Make sure you separate who you are from what you have and what you do. You transcend what's happening in your life as you come to the realization that what's happening in your life is only temporary and will always be changing. It's important to understand that your higher self is changeless. When you identify with your temporary nature, you take on the belief that what you have and what you do is the real you. It's possibly the biggest error that you can make in life. To experience your own magnificence requires that you separate what you have and what you do from who you are. Learn to separate the performance from the performer, to become involved in what's happening in your life, but not to identify with its temporary nature. As you stand on the seashore and watch the ships sail by, there's no problem as long as you simply stand there and watch them go by. It's only when you identify with the ships that you feel pain and suffering. If you say, that's my ship, then you will grieve when it passes from your sight. If you say, I must command that ship, then you will live in fear that someone else will become its captain. Likewise, by simply watching and observing our mistakes and unworkable behavior without judgment, we prevent harmful identification with our temporary mistakes, faults, and errors. As you start to question and look honestly at your life, you come to the point where you begin to realize that the only authority figure is within yourself. We look to other authorities to tell us what we're supposed to do, but the only person who will ever know what to do is ourselves. Have you ever wondered why certain people are conned by con artists? A con artist cannot con someone who's not out to get something for nothing. A con artist cannot con someone who does not want to be conned. People have trouble understanding why others take advantage of them. The reason they get taken advantage of is because they give their power away and they don't want to be responsible for their own lives. They don't want to make their own decisions, so they allow others to do it for them. But understand this truth. If you allow others to do it for you, they'll do it to you. As long as you let others have responsibility for your life, they will control your destiny. It's easy to say that others are to blame, but this type of thinking puts us further into bondage because we set limits on our freedom. Once again, straightening up our thinking involves separating what we have and what we do from who we are inside, separating the doer from the deed. The secret is to live in this world but not let the world live in us. We want our boat in the water, but we don't want the water in our boat. When the water's in our boat, we start to sink, and we have to bail like crazy to stay afloat. We find ourselves drowning in the water of physical effects that we've created in our lives. Once we're drowning, we don't know any other way to deal with it except to fight it. Before I go any further, let me ask you, why do you want to change your world? Every time we attempt to change whatever's going on around us, whether it be our business, our career, the government, members of our family, our mate, or whatever, we're operating under the illusion that these people and events are doing something to us. Actually, what we need to do is to change our experience in relation to them. People and events never do anything to us. They merely trigger feelings that are already within us. 
If we go back to the basic principle of life, we understand that nothing happens in the world that we don't permit deep within our consciousness. It's been said many ways that it is done unto you as you believe, and sometimes those beliefs are very deep. Whatever is going on within our heart is in fundamental alignment with our outside experiences, even though we may not be consciously aware of it. I know this principle is difficult to accept because there are undoubtedly things in your life that you consciously do not want. However, the truth of the matter is there's some deep inner need that you're satisfying. If you'll be totally honest with yourself and take a good look at what's going on in your life, you'll discover what is actually unfolding. Therefore, it stands to reason that if we attempt and are successful in changing the outer effect but don't change the inner causation, we will only create the same experience again. If you no longer know what to do, this process of self-evaluation is a very good path to finding yourself. It will help you to understand that the mechanical thinking process cannot rise above its own limited level. If you're not sure what to do or if you have any anxiety, don't try to seek release from the anxiety. Just stay where you are and let it tell you something extraordinary, and it will. If you're unhappy, realize that all unhappiness is caused by comparison. Did you hear that? All unhappiness is caused by comparison. We only feel unhappy when we compare what we have now to something else. Perhaps when we were younger or healthier, or when we were with a certain person or possessed certain honors and recognition. When there is no comparison, unhappiness is impossible. Happiness exists when the mind is not removed from itself, when it remains in the present time zone, and when it declines to contrast itself with other times or conditions. Imagine an unhappy person sitting at home stating, I want to change my life. This person redecorates his house. Then he finds himself just as unhappy as before. So he redecorates several times, and he still feels no change in himself. Do you know people who believe that they can change their level of happiness by changing their exterior scenery? Where have they made a mistake? Where can they correct themselves? If you have the answer to these questions, you have a powerful tool for personal growth. So the truth about you is that you're not what you have and you're not what you do. You are spiritually whole, complete, and perfect, and your success in life will be in direct proportion to your ability to accept this truth about yourself. What are you telling yourself? It's a demonstrated fact of life that you and I do not behave in accordance with the reality of what we can do, but in accordance with the reality of what we believe we can do. It stands to reason if we change the way we believe, we can change the way we act. Human beings record what they are thinking about. As infants, our thoughts were emotions, and so we recorded emotion. Then we began to put pictures with emotion. Then we labeled those pictures with words. As adults, we now think in one or all of those three-dimensional forms, usually in the form of words first. This is referred to as self-talk. Self-talk is a process by which words trigger pictures that bring about emotions. Every emotional thought leaves a record in the neuron cell structure of the brain. We do not record what is happening. Rather, we record what we think is happening. It is this record of interpretation that begins to shape our personality. A prime example of how this works can be seen in children from the same family background who develop different personalities and lifestyles. It was not what happened to them as children that was recorded, but what they perceived was happening. It was their interpretations that formed their different personalities and attitudes, even though they came from the same family background. One thought alone does not form our self-image. It takes an accumulation of experiences or thoughts to build our self-image. The key to freedom is to control what we think about and our perception of reality as we see it. Other people can hand us opinions about ourselves. They can tell us how great we are or they can put us down. 
that information is not recorded and does not become part of our belief system until we accept it with our own thoughts. We are not as successful as we can be because of our opinion of ourselves. As we see ourselves or believe ourselves to be, we act in accord with that belief whether it is true or not. Whenever we get a strong belief, whenever we think what we know is the truth, we then lock onto that belief as a defense against conflicting beliefs. We cannot hold conflicting beliefs in our mind without anxiety or distress. So what we do is gather supportive data and information to prove we are right and not crazy for believing what we believe. This can work against us in seeking out the truth because we operate in accord with the truth as we see it and not as it is. Sometimes we hold on to opinions, attitudes, and beliefs that no longer serve us. This is why we must examine our beliefs on a regular basis to see where we might be lying to ourselves or blocking out information that may be more relevant. Why don't we do this? We lock out the truth because we don't want to be wrong, make a mistake, or feel bad. Self-talk is the constant conversation we carry on with ourselves as we perceive what we think, see, and hear. It is the three-dimensional form of thought made up of words, pictures, and emotion. We build and modify our self-image with our self-talk, using words that trigger pictures that evoke a feeling or an emotion. Our self-image is an accumulation of all thoughts, attitudes, and opinions we have perceived and stored about ourselves since childhood. It is the subconscious picture that we have been recording for many years. This picture controls how we think and how we perform. Once we vividly imagine an experience, it is recorded in our subconscious and we are stuck with it until we make a conscious choice to displace it. If you choose to make changes in your self-image, you can use self-talk and visualization to create a new picture that will enact the changes you desire. All meaningful and lasting change starts first in mind or in the imagination and then works its way outward into reality. Every statement you make has an effect on your subconscious, so it is important to be very careful about what you say about you. Remember, other people can hand you their opinions about you, but what you think about you is what determines your self-image. The impact of building a positive or negative self-image is powerful because our self-image is stored in the subconscious as reality. Our subconscious believes the information it stores is true, whether it is true or not. If someone calls you stupid, it makes an original recording on your subconscious. Every time you replay the experience of being called stupid, as far as your subconscious is concerned, it is happening all over again, because the subconscious does not recognize the difference between a real or imagined experience. Each time we replay the same thought, it gets recorded as reality all over again and reinforces the dominant belief, in this case, I am stupid. As these thoughts accumulate, they bring about patterns of belief. As we allow these thoughts to build up in our minds, we then act out those beliefs, thus we live a self-fulfilling prophecy. Our level of expectation, be it of ourselves, another person, a day, a task, or a situation, determines the outcome. Once we lock onto a preconceived notion of how we think things are going to work out, we then go out and create the situation or gather information to make it a reality, and sure enough, we get what we expect. This is called the sure enough principle. You can see that your self-talk either reinforces an already existing self-image or belief, or it can be used to modify, for better or worse, opinions and attitudes that you have about yourself. My self-image controls how I perform or my performance reality. I always act like I see myself. I cannot act otherwise. I can try to act otherwise, but I will have to work very hard to override my subconscious picture of reality. I automatically behave like the me who is controlled by my picture. What formed the picture in the first place was my self-talk. Each time I affirm I am a certain way, I record it in my image of reality. 
I act according to my image of reality automatically, without thinking about it. And after I act like I thought I was supposed to, I talk to myself about it. I continually tell myself, with self-talk, what I just did. I say to myself, that's the way I am, which reinforces the picture. I say, I always act this way, which reaffirms the image, which in turn ensures I will do it the same way next time. This is known as the self-reinforcing cycle. The self-reinforcing cycle works like this. 1. I notice my performance of a task, how I act and how others evaluate my actions. 2. I talk to myself about my performance through my self-talk or affirmative statements. 3. My self-talk reinforces either a positive or a negative self-image or how I feel about myself. 4. How I feel about myself forms a self-image which is the regulating mechanism that controls how I perform the next time. Most people, after they have performed below their level of expectations, or if they anticipated poor performance in their imaginations, reinforce the negative experience with statements such as, there I go again, that's just like me, that's the way I am, it happens every time, this is going to be one of those days, etc. Whenever your behavior doesn't match your self-image, you will say to yourself, that's not the way I am, or that's not like me. These statements will only ensure continued poor performance by reinforcing the poor self-image. The only choice you have is to live up to your picture. We have to learn to cease attacking our self-image at those times when our performance does not live up to our expectations, because our negative self-talk will only increase poor performance. So how do we correct this? The first thing we need to say to ourselves when we are engaged in negative self-talk is, stop it. Then follow up with a statement such as, I am much better than that. The next phase is the key phrase. Say to yourself, the next time I will. Then make an affirmation of how you are going to do it next time. Shut off the old picture. Shut off the negative movement. Don't tolerate poor performance from yourself or others, but don't put yourself or others down by focusing on what is wrong. Just say, the next time I will do it this way. If we are working with others, we can say, the next time I want you to approach the client this way, or the next time you will do it like this. What you are doing with these statements is giving positive and immediate feedback to your subconscious. Instead of recording the negative picture, you trigger the picture of the performance you want. The key to reinforcing an already existing positive self-image or modifying your self-image for the better is to visualize what you want your performance to look like the next time and to stop picturing, thinking about, and talking about what you are trying to avoid. When your performance pleases you and you feel good about it, you should use positive self-talk to reinforce the positive picture. Affirm to yourself, that's the way I am. That's like me. Positive self-talk statements are the best way to maintain or build your own self-esteem. They deliberately cancel out the negative put-downs we apply to ourselves or to the opinions other people try to make us accept about ourselves. The size and scope of your goals will increase proportionately with your self-esteem. When you have low self-esteem, you will attract negative influences that will prevent you from reaching your goals. Take a look at the clients you are dealing with or the relationships in which you are involved. The fact is that you will always associate with people you feel worthy of being with. This includes your friends as well as your clients if you are in business. Take a look at your material possessions. You draw to yourself that which you feel you are worthy of receiving. The car you drive, the clothes you wear, the home you live in. The total quantity and quality of your life is determined by your self-esteem or self-worth. What kind of labels are you putting on yourself? Each one of us has dozens, perhaps hundreds of labels we have given ourselves during our lifetime. I'm a good manager. I'm assertive, shy, warm, friendly, stupid, short-tempered, hard to get along with, lazy, or poor. Because we act like we see ourselves, these labels or opinions govern our behavior. Some of the labels are helpful. 
but in order to grow and develop, some of the labels need to be changed. Again, we must be careful how we talk to ourselves. The problem is that whatever self-image we have accepted puts a ceiling on the use of our potential. That ceiling has no relationship to our ability to use our potential. But we can only act or perform like the person we see ourselves to be. We must deliberately take control of our self-talk or it will control us. The opinions or labels we have of ourselves cannot be totally erased because they are stored in our subconscious memory, but they can be displaced through self-talk. The new positive message will then become our dominant opinion, and we always act in accord with our dominant opinion or belief. The most important reason for changing our image when we are dissatisfied with our performance in a particular area is that our self-image controls our performance. Our behavior is automatic. Until we change the picture we have of ourselves, we will automatically continue to reenact the same performance. Our self-image regulates the use of our potential. Anytime we move away from our self-image, anxiety and tension will set in because we are constantly working to act like the self we perceive ourselves to be. Our self-image is what we believe we are capable of doing right now. When we find ourselves being forced by our own intent or by the situations around us, out of where we feel comfortable, away from where we know we subconsciously belong, anxiety and tension sets in. We not only have an internal comfort zone or expectancy level that concerns the kind of behavior that's expected of us, but we have also been programmed as to the kind of environment in which we belong. We have, for example, a subconscious picture of the kind of car we should be driving, the income we deserve, the restaurants we feel comfortable in, the situations we feel comfortable in, etc. It is important for us to be aware that whenever we find ourselves straying from that picture, negative tension reminds us to get back where you belong forcing us to return to the environment we subconsciously know we belong in. As you can see, this response makes change difficult or slow at best. Every time we find ourselves in an unfamiliar environment, job, or social situation, we will come up with logical reasons why we should not participate, why it won't work, or why we should stay where we are. The problem is we didn't deliberately program the kind of environment in which we feel comfortable. Our subconscious just absorbed through observation where we think we should be. The key to change is the ability to visualize ourselves in a different situation, environment, car, job, relationship, or career. Only vivid imagery in the first person and in the present tense changes your reality. This will be discussed later in the section on Program Your Mind for the Best. But for now, it is necessary only to understand that visualization is not like watching a movie. Only images experienced and identified with in the first person, present tense, change reality. If we can't identify with the image, we can't have it, because it doesn't register on the subconscious level. If I don't identify with what I am visualizing, I'm left with the impression that other people can be, have, or do this, but not me. It's okay for them, but I don't think I could ever do it. You must see yourself in your picture. Deliberate affirmation or self-talk, combined with visualization, produces the end result. As we continue to do it over and over again, pretty soon our subconscious accepts that it is true for us. In the beginning, there will be conflict between where I am or what I have and what I am accepting subconsciously. One of the primary functions of the subconscious, however, is to resolve conflicts between what we are thinking about and what we are experiencing in our reality. And because our subconscious is creative, it will begin to create what we are thinking about and what we are visualizing. The real key here is in not trying to be different from your picture. Modify the picture first. Real growth and change begins from the inside out. We must first change the picture in our mind. As we do this, our comfort zone will expand automatically. 
this becomes our new truth. We then act in accordance with that new truth or belief. How do you know what your self-image is? Take a look at your actions, your behavior, and your performance. Also, ask yourself, what do I expect of me? Where do I feel out of place? If you see yourself as poor, you will unconsciously do things to make yourself lose. When you lose, what do you suppose you say to yourself? That's the way I am. I always lose out. I'll never have any money. This reinforces the picture, which causes you to fail again, which causes your self-talk, which reinforces the picture, and so it continues. People without money feel victimized, but what they don't understand is that they live a self-fulfilling prophecy. This is why the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. It has nothing to do with money. People with winning self-images cause themselves to do things that win. If they lose occasionally, they don't accept it as their fate. They know that losing is not normal for them. They reject it by saying, that's not like me, or that's not the way things happen for me, or the next time I will change this. Attitudes are extremely important in determining the difference between success or failure. What are attitudes? Attitudes are dominant beliefs. In and of themselves, attitudes are neither positive nor negative. The evaluation of an attitude is always in relation to our goal. Once we set the goal, an attitude either supports us or keeps us from obtaining the goal. For example, being an introvert in itself is neutral. However, if your goal is to be a public speaker, such an attitude wouldn't support you in obtaining your goal. The attitudes we have developed cause us to seek out or avoid situations. We picked up most of our attitudes without deliberate intent. Most of them were formed unconsciously. On the other hand, if we have attitudes that cause us to avoid situations, we can make a conscious decision to change them. All we need to do is to make a new affirmation, visualize the end result, what we choose to have as a response, and re-picture ourselves as being a person who has that emotional response. You can visualize yourself seeking out, or in some cases avoiding, if you choose, a particular action in your daily life. Attitudes allow us to grow or prevent us from growing, depending on how we use them. The subconscious is a system of checks and balances. It always makes sure our image of reality comes true. It works to keep us from going insane. Because our subconscious records our habits of thought, regardless of whether they are good for us or not, we need to begin to evaluate whether we are operating on valid information. Is this information appropriate for our goals today? Is it appropriate for where we choose to be at this time? In dealing with the world around us, our actions are based on those habits of thought accepted by our subconscious. We need to examine our habits of thought to see if they are relevant to our success and which ones further our progress towards our goals and which do not. We will either stay where we are or, through our own deliberate intent, convince ourselves that it's in our best interest to change. If we choose to change, we must visualize ourselves into that new belief. Constructive self-talk and imagery takes the ceiling off the use of our preconceived abilities and allows us to grow in a controlled manner without stress, tension, and negative feedback. It should be understood we have an overall self-image as well as a specific self-image for specific areas of our lives. Each self-image is formed in the same manner. The job of my subconscious is to creatively ensure that I am always acting in accord with the truth as I see it. My performance, how I act or behave, is controlled by my self-image. Instead of working on our actions, we want to work on our self-image. Now how do we go about that? The same way that our self-image was established in the first place, through self-talk. Work on our self-talk begins in any given area we choose to change. We start to control our self-talk so that when our behavior is other than what we want it to be, we will say to ourselves in some manner, that's not the way I am, that's not like me. Then make an affirmation as to what me is like. It's like me to be a winner. It's like me to be loving. 
It's like me to be successful. It's like me to be outgoing. When I do something that is successful, something that in the past would not have been like me, I must then, through my self-talk, reinforce my belief by saying, that's the way I am. That's like the new me. I am successful, easy to get along with, outgoing, etc. As I do that, the subconscious records my self-talk. It does not record what is happening. It records my opinion of what is happening. What I image to be true is what I record. We move toward what we picture. We physically, emotionally, and psychologically create, through activity and movement, what we hold as a picture in our minds, whether it is good for us or not. As long as we hold the picture, we are drawn toward that picture. We control our imagery through directed self-talk. We can image ourselves into new behavior, even though right now it may be opposite to the way we are behaving or acting. Remember, thought must come before action. Don't be concerned about your actions. Only be concerned about your self-talk and mental picture. Make sure they are controlled to bring about a desired end result. As the picture changes, so will your performance. Our subconscious creative mechanism knows exactly where we are in time and space in relationship to the target, the relationship to where we are right now and end result we are trying to achieve. If we get off course, negative feedback will motivate us to stay on course. This stimulates the creative energy and drive to attract people, material things, new books, seminars, or whatever else we need to create the picture in our mind. But the picture must come first. We can't start without a picture. This subconscious creative mechanism provides us with a powerful technique for utilizing our creative abilities. Because we move toward what we picture, it is important to control what we are picturing. The goal must be clearly and specifically defined. What are we after? What does it look like? If you cannot describe it, you cannot get it. One of the biggest traps we fall into is forcing change, such as trying to discipline ourselves and saying to ourselves, I have to do this. I have to lose weight. I have to work harder. That very push is the subconscious working against the end result. Anytime you tell yourself you have to do something, it is the job of your subconscious to say, no, you don't. You don't have to do anything. I'll get you out of it. And with creative avoidance, procrastination, or in any way possible, you find a way not to do it. When you say, I have to, you are saying, I have to, but if I had my own way, I would rather be doing something else. The harder you try to do something, the more you work against your natural subconscious creative mechanism. When I recognize I can, I choose to, or I want to change because it is my idea to become like that, then I have a power around me that most people have chosen to give up. Once I recognize I am a self-made person, both in success and failure, and that this success or failure is mine to control, I will stop saying, I have to, and instead say, I choose to. I can be as my image tells me I can and move constructively toward that end result with an exciting magnetic energy and drive. When you can rely on promises to yourself and to others, you become a powerful person. We are only as strong as our word is strong. If you give your word to others that you are going to be someplace at a particular time, we'll call at a particular time, make this or that change, or say you can be counted on, you must be able to follow through because every time you don't keep your word, you lose your power. It is not only your word to others because you can make excuses. It is also the word you give to yourself when you say you intend to do something. When you give yourself your word to keep your agreements with yourself, you know you can count on yourself. With that power, that feeling, that belief, there's not much you cannot do because you know you make things happen. It is simply a matter of keeping our minds off what we don't want and on what we do want. Don't spend your time imaging and imprinting what you are trying to avoid. Instead of going away from something, 
go towards something. This is sound psychology. Too often we get caught up in being realistic. I have always been this way. This is the way I behave. This is the way I am. This is the way things always happen to me. The best advice I can share with you is never go by past track records. Every moment is a new beginning. Successful high performance people look at what they want and move toward the end result. So what is it that I want? We must decide that for ourselves. What makes me a happy person? Why do I go to work? Why do I go to school? Why am I involved in anything? What do I want for myself? What everyone wants in life is to feel good. It's that simple. It is the feeling we are after. We tend to go after things to get the feeling. The things are just an excuse to play the game. What is it that is going to turn me on? What do I enjoy doing? This is the key question. Once I know that, and the answer is going to be different for each person, I can fit in all the other pieces to support my goal. I have come to the realization that when I develop a philosophy of my life and do my best to be true to that philosophy, then all the questions about what I want to do are easily answered. If you have an overall view, you will know the specifics. Then you will draw the people you want to draw to you. You will know what you will want to do in your work and in your relationships because everything and everyone necessary to support your philosophy will come into your life. It is also important to be willing to change your philosophy if it does not support you in being all you can be. When you consciously use the tools of self-talk and imagery, you deliberately throw your system out of order. Understand you will be driven strongly, almost obsessively, into whatever you are affirming and imaging. If you only use the concepts in one area of your life, you will become obsessive about that. Setting goals with equal proportional balance is the key so that you do not steal from one part of your life to fulfill another. Start by knowing where you want to go and begin to talk to yourself about it. Self-talk combined with constructive imagery are the most powerful tools you can use to go from where you are right now to where you want to be. Believing is seeing. In this section, I want to give you some tools for becoming a powerful goal setter. The concepts and ideas in this section may change the way you approach your whole life from now on. There is a general belief that is commonly accepted in this culture. The belief is that seeing is believing. In essence, we must be realistic. If I can see it, then I'll believe it. We have already learned that human beings behave not in accordance with the truth, but in accordance with the truth as they perceive it to be. People who must see it before they can believe it, or must have concrete feedback before they will take risk, find it very difficult to grow and change. Most of their lives are spent waiting for something to happen rather than making it happen. We stimulate our creative energy and drive in direct proportion to our ability to use our imagination. However, Use of our imagination is limited by our perception of reality. All of us have some natural limitations in perceiving reality, but we can expand our awareness of this reality. We are not limited by it unless we choose to be limited. In order to change this, we must be willing to take a good look to see if our perception of reality is perhaps limited or distorted. No two people have the same awareness or perception of reality. This accounts for the uniqueness of each individual. Although we perceive the same world, we interpret what we see differently. To the degree our awareness or perception is limited, our habits, thoughts, and actions will also be limited. Our awareness is simply a combination of all the experiences, impressions, and attitudes we have accumulated since birth. Our awareness can be summed up as our total life experience. Our awareness determines the clarity with which we perceive and understand everything that affects our life. It isn't what we know that gets us into trouble. It's what we think we know that isn't so. Everything that happens in our life is filtered through our awareness. 
we then act in accordance with our present level of awareness. If our awareness is faulty, our actions will be faulty. Every decision we make and every action we take is based on our level of awareness at any given moment. In order to be all we can be, we must constantly work to change and expand our level of awareness or our perception of reality. One of the faulty perceptions in most people's awareness is that seeing is believing. But the truth is, because we can't see it, it doesn't mean it is not there. The reason we don't see opportunities or solutions is not because they aren't there or because we can't see. It is because we haven't determined what we are looking for. Rather than wait to see before believing, we must first set our goals before reality will change. When we set a goal, our brain-mind functioning together, which is a natural filtering device, will work to our advantage to attain our goal. The first thing we must do is ask, what is of value to me? What attitudes or opinions are important or valuable to me? What am I looking for? What is it that I want? What end result do I want? These questions and their answers play a very important role in your success. The interplay between your brain and mind, your brain-mind functioning, will not support you in obtaining your goals until it clearly understands exactly what you want. The information will not get through until you can answer the question, What do I want? Wrap your mind around this idea. You must know what you want before you can become aware of how to get it. By determining first what is of value to you, you automatically let information that is important to you filter through. You will increase your awareness of valuable opportunities and information that will help you obtain your goal by knowing exactly what you want, exactly what kind of house, job, car, income, client, relationship, etc. Our brain-mind functioning naturally filters out any information that is not of value to us or does not pose a threat to our security. It is important to understand this. Any information that is not of value to you or does not pose a threat to your survival does not get through to you. It automatically gets filtered out. Like a spam filter on your email, the brain-mind functioning together screens out thousands of messages and allows those messages or information to get through that have value to you. If it allowed any and all information to come through, it would overload your nervous system and you would be unable to cope with all the data presented to it. To ensure your survival, it also allows threats of physical or psychological harm to be perceived and understood. There is simply too much information constantly coming at us. It's impossible for all of it to get through. So we must determine exactly what we want. This will allow our brain-mind mechanism to become highly selective as to what information is of real value to us. Once we determine what we want, the information will start to flow through. Remember, because we cannot see it does not mean it does not exist. It only means we are blocking out information that is not important to us at the moment. This blocking is natural and simply a protective mechanism to keep us from going insane. Unchecked, however, this mechanism can limit our possibilities. There is at any given time a vast amount of information available to support you in creating whatever you desire. However, most people, or groups of people, and businesses fall into this category, try to solve problems without first determining exactly what they wish to accomplish. They make decisions based on the available facts or the resources they have at the present moment. The natural response is, we can't do that. We don't know where the money is coming from. Who's going to help us? We don't have what we need. We don't have what it takes. Or, we don't have enough experience with this. What I want to share with you is this. You don't need to know all those answers. In fact, if you did have the answers to all those questions, that information would, in the present moment, probably work against you. What you do need to know is, what is the end result? Where do you want to end up? What do you want to create? Set the goal first, and the necessary information will get through. 
having all the information first without the goal only confuses the mind and works against you. Remember this, information does not come through first. Before the information can be filtered through, your brain-mind functioning together must lock onto the goal or end result. Once that is set, everything you need to know to accomplish the end result will present itself to you. Unless something has personal value or threatens our security, we will not be conscious of the information that we need. In order to be conscious of this information, we must have the goal first. High-performance people, people that get things done, know this secret. Believing is seeing. Everybody else wants to have the facts first before they will believe, but it doesn't work that way. You must believe in the goal first, and then you will see how to do it because the necessary information will get through. You must determine what is of value to you, what kind of client you want, what kind of home you want, what kind of knowledge you want, before it gets through. As an example, suppose you are interested in a particular brand of automobile. Perhaps you are considering buying one, or you have just bought one. Notice that as soon as you decide what you want, you see this make of car everywhere. Why? Because that car has value to you. This example could be applied to the goals of finding clients, jobs, businesses, or people with whom you would like to be involved. As soon as you know what you are looking for, the opportunities and the information will become apparent. If you don't know what you are looking for, you won't find it, even if it passes through your life every day. This also applies to your clients or customers. Knowing exactly what your customers or clients want will increase your awareness of how to help them obtain it. If you don't know exactly what they want, the information on how to help them will not get through. If you want to be a good conversationalist, you would better say something of value to the other person before you can get through. Otherwise, they will just filter out or block out the conversation. We only pay attention to what is of value to us. Another reason we don't see opportunities is that we limit ourselves by the way we think. We must be willing to think outside our limitations. We often feel uncomfortable psychologically when we experience contradictory or conflicting opinions, beliefs, or attitudes at the same time. It is possible to hold different attitudes without emotional disharmony as long as the situation does not occur in which these attitudes are brought into direct confrontation. Generally, when people are placed into a new and unfamiliar environment or situation, a change of behavior or a modification of an attitude is necessary to lessen or eliminate the anxiety caused by the change. We are always seeking to maintain psychological balance by attempting to get things to fit together inside of ourselves. The most common way to relieve conflicts is through rationalization. Rationalization is what people use when they attempt to explain their logic or reason for their actions, or opinion, or conduct. In order for a person not to look foolish or make embarrassing mistakes, he will gather people and information that support his opinion or justify his conduct. An example is when we meet a person of the opposite sex, and we are attracted to a particular trait in that person, the tendency is to subconsciously see only the good features and block out the negative traits. This justifies our reason to have a relationship with that person. Before a person makes a commitment or a decision, he will usually go through a stage where he evaluates the overall situation. During this time, that person will usually be open to new information. However, once he makes a decision or a commitment, he will start to gather only people or facts that make him look good or make him right for believing and acting the way he does. This process is called clustering. Unfortunately, when we seek to prove we are right for being the way we are or choosing what we choose, we block out information that may be useful to us in making rational decisions, essentially blinding ourselves to our other options. When we lock onto an idea or a reason as to why something won't work, the solution does not get through. Because we can't see a solution does not mean that it is not there. 
If you tell yourself that there is no way to expand your business, no way to complete this or that project, no way to get something done or get what you want, you focus on the problem instead of the solution. You can use your subconscious to help you gain answers and solutions, or you can use the same subconscious to come up with reasons or rationalizations why it can't be done. The choice is always there, and the choice is always yours. An example of this is when you want to buy something. Most people shop around for the lowest price. Once they've found the item they want, they usually will try to come up with creative ways to cut back on expenses or do without something so they can afford it. But what they don't realize is that they could use the same creative energy to figure out a way to keep what they have and earn more money to buy what they want. In other words, they can use the same creative energy to move backward or move forward. When fear sets in, we very easily rationalize why we should retreat, give up, cut back, or why we can't do something. Are you using your energies trying to figure out what things aren't available to you or can't happen for you, or are you putting your energy into how you can make them happen? Another reason we see problems and failures instead of solutions or opportunities is because we do not feel worthy of being, doing, or having the things we truly desire. The problem is that we can only attract that which we feel worthy of. The greater your feelings of self-worth, the higher the value you have of yourself, the more options you have, and the more risks you can take. The better you think of yourself, the more others will want to be part of your life. They will want to be your client, your customer, or your friend. A person with a strong sense of self-worth says, I can handle anything. I don't know how to handle it yet, but I didn't need to know how to do this until now. Now that it is here, the information will come through. Everything then becomes an opportunity to learn and do more. Sometimes the information we need will come through other people. It can come in the form of a suggestion or even a criticism. However, if we have poor self-esteem or self-worth, we will not be able to accept suggestions or handle criticism from others. Our response will be defensive, such as, why should I listen to my subordinates? Why should I listen to my children? What can they possibly know that I don't know? Why should I listen to my mate? I'm smarter than he or she is. But the error we make is this. When we accept only our opinion, we shut out everything else. Again, our self-esteem or self-worth is not strong enough to accept input from others. How many times have you said, don't tell me how to do it, I want to do it myself? What you are really saying is, I don't want you to show me, because then you will appear smarter or more intelligent than I am. Because I have low self-esteem, I have to look good all the time. We have to allow others to be our teachers. This doesn't mean we have to accept everything they say, but it is to our advantage to at least listen to them to see if what they have to say is of value. It doesn't matter who helps you or who shows you the way. The only thing that matters is the end result. A healthy response is, if you can show me how to get there easier, better, or faster, then I want to learn from you. When you are unable to figure out how to get what you want, it isn't because you're stupid. It's because you are conditioned not to see beyond your present level of awareness. In business, there is a tendency to lock on to approaches that are traditional. This is the way we have always done it. When we use that type of thinking and lock on to the way it was, we blind ourselves to the way it can be. So ask yourself these questions. What ideas, beliefs, or attitudes have I accepted? Is there an idea, opinion, or attitude that I have that is not supporting me in getting where I want to go, doing what I want to do, or being what I want to be? If there is, then you must be willing to let go of that idea, belief, or attitude and concentrate on the end result. You need to allow new information that will facilitate you in permitting the end result to get through. I want you to recognize that you don't need to know anything about a particular subject you want to learn or business you want to go into. 
Because you lack experience in something or weren't good in a certain school subject doesn't mean you are incapable of learning it. It just means that the information as to how to go about it wasn't of value to you in the past. But watch how the information comes pouring through now that you have clearly defined what you want. What I am leading you to is this. Once you decide on how you want to live, what you want your group to accomplish, or what you personally want to create, the process becomes exciting because the information will come through and you will go out and find a way to attain that goal. I also encourage you to not only make things happen for yourself, but also for your business, your company, your family, or any group you are working with. It isn't so much what you believe, but what you can get the people around you to believe. The key is getting others to believe they are far more capable than they think they are. And to get them to stop dwelling on their limitations, why something can't be done, or the way they acted in the past. You want them to begin focusing their attention on where they want to go, or what they want to become. Once again, the end result is the only thing that counts. When you have an idea or belief, and are seeking to create something that did not exist before, a new product, service, business, or whatever, your problem won't be your belief in the idea. It will be trying to convince those around you that it is possible. In order to get help and cooperation from others in reaching a goal, your biggest problem will be how to get others to believe in you. How can I get them to support me? This is the problem that every leader faces. It isn't so much a matter of what the leader believes, but rather what the leader can get the people around him or her to believe. We know that everyone acts in accordance with the truth as they perceive it to be. If their perception of reality is faulty, they will come up with logical reasons why it won't work, why it can't be done, why it's impossible, why it's too difficult to accomplish. Remember, they are not intentionally trying to sabotage you or hold you back. They are acting in accord with the truth as they perceive it to be. The challenge is how to lead people to believe that they can do more than they think they are capable of doing. Perhaps you can see that your children have potential, but it doesn't do you any good to see their potential if they can't see it. Perhaps you can see your employee's potential or your mate's potential, but it is meaningless until they can see it, because they must act in accord with the truth as they perceive it to be. Good leaders, parents, and mates are able to help others to change their level of expectation to change what they believe is true. They are able to motivate them to believe in something that they did not believe before and then help them to self-talk and image that belief into reality. In order to do that, you can't just ask them to blindly follow you. People today are too sophisticated for that. As children, we do it because we live on faith. But very soon we become logical adults and we want logical reasons. We have to teach others how to create from an idea, how to use the tools that we are learning throughout this recording. If they are not willing to use the tools, they will do everything they can to prove they are right in believing what they believe, and in the end, they will either try to sabotage you or try to stop you to make themselves right. Take a look at the people in your life that are telling you, it can't be done, there is no way. I can't see how it can be done. Are you allowing these people to determine whether you are capable or not? In essence, are you giving your power away to these people? If you are, make a decision to reclaim that power. What kind of people do you surround yourself with in your business? Are they people who are always looking for reasons why it can't be done? Or are you surrounding yourself with people who find solutions? Be very careful when choosing the kind of people with whom you surround yourself, because they strongly influence your creativity, whether you realize it or not. Their negativity becomes contagious in your office, in your relationships, in your family, and in your business. People who believe that things can't be done will go out and prove themselves right. But people who know things can be done go out and make it happen. If you have a business, don't pay people to tell you that something can't be done. 
you can think of all the reasons why it can't be done yourself. You don't need to have people around you to tell you it can't be done and then pay them for the privilege. Surround yourself with people of high self-esteem who can tell you how to get the job done, how to make it happen. Teach them to look for solutions instead of problems. Every strong leader sets a goal and then does whatever is necessary to make it happen. If you educate the people around you to start setting goals based not on what is available, but on what it is you want to accomplish, you will be a strong leader and the people around you will become high-performance people. In order to experience growth or change, we must learn to alter our level of expectation. To change our expectancy level, we must have a strong belief in ourselves and our goals. We must know we can take an idea and make it happen. Everybody else wants to see it before they believe it, but you must believe it before you even see it. As you have more faith in your own power, you will transmit this to others. With this knowledge of your own capabilities and those of the people around you, you can do things that to others seem unrealistic or impossible. What this all boils down to is having the ability to accomplish tasks that others find difficult or impossible. How many goals have you set based on what was apparent, on what you can see, what you have, and what you think is realistic? Don't base your goals on what you have or what you have done, but on what you want and where you ultimately want to go. What we are talking about here can be summed up in one word, faith. Faith is not something religious or esoteric. It is a sound psychological and physiological fact. When you understand how the brain-mind functions together, you know that faith, which is believing before seeing, is the natural process of creation. When you understand that it is your belief or faith in your ability to create that determines your results, you are then able to go out and accomplish tasks that other people think are impossible. You simply set your sights on what you want and then allow the information that will enable you to go out and create it without stress and without effort to come through. The reality is that whatever you are looking for is at the same time looking for you. It all starts with believing before seeing. Write Your Own Script all living things have an innate desire to reach their potential. The problem is that this desire to grow and develop makes us unhappy with the way things are. We have three main beliefs about life that prevent us from being happy and satisfied. The first is that what I don't have is better than what I do have. This is a variation of the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. The second belief is that having more is better. No matter how much I have, more of it would be better. And the third is, when I get what I want, I will be happy. Perhaps you are familiar with the term success ethic. The success ethic, stated simply, says, when you get what you want, you will be happy. It is based on the theory that if we work hard and solve all the problems in our lives, someday we will be happy. The majority of our thought and activities in life are centered around solving problems. As we've learned, whatever you think about becomes your reality. And so, what do you think about most of the time? It is usually problems. Indeed, the first thing that many of us think about when we get out of bed in the morning are all the problems that we have to solve and how hard we have to work. We have been trained to think about what isn't, what should be, and what we don't have, and then how we might remedy a situation, solve it, or make it better. And so, when you first wake up, you focus automatically on all the problems that you must face that day. 
If you will take an honest look at your life, however, you will probably find that solving problems, working hard, and having the right things do not fundamentally improve the quality of your life. In fact, it is probably taken away from the quality of your life by diminishing the fun and excitement of living. Let's talk about the creative process. You and I want to create our lives in the best possible manner. To do this, we must flow with life instead of flowing against life. To flow with life, we want to create from the model of being, doing, having. The universe flows from being into doing into having. Being is an inner experience. It comes from within you. You can allow outer circumstances to determine your state of being, your level of happiness or satisfaction, but you run the very real risk of those outer circumstances controlling your life and how you feel about yourself. If you say, I'll be happy when, you will never be happy. Suppose you think a new job will change your life. So you get a new job, and pretty soon it is the same old stuff. You have to deal with people, handle responsibility, meet deadlines, and work with others who are not as enlightened as you. That is the reality of it. You then realize that this job didn't make any major difference in the way you feel, so you have to find something else to make you happy. Maybe you think a new mate, a new home, having a baby, or making more money will change your life. And so eventually you get all those things, and you are still not happy. The reason is simple. Nothing outside of ourselves will ever make us happy, because happiness is an inside-out experience, and it starts at the being level. We have talked about how the universe flows from being into doing into having. But unfortunately, this success ethic, which most people are using to create their lives, flows from having into doing into being. The success ethic states that if you have the things that happy and satisfied people have, you will do what happy and satisfied people do, and then you will be happy and satisfied. Is this really true? Well, you and I have more of everything than any generation on this planet. We have more time to do what we want, more money to spend on what we want, and we are more technologically advanced than any civilization in the history of this planet. Yet look around you and notice that as a culture, we are far from being either happy or satisfied. The truth is that life flows from being to doing into having. If you are being happy and satisfied from the inside out, you will start doing what happy and satisfied people do, and you will have what happy and satisfied people have. One of the Buddha's great contributions was his teaching that desire creates suffering. This means that when you want something more and you don't accept what you already have, you suffer. Now, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't create more things in your life. On the contrary, you and I are purposeful, creative beings. But so many of us are unhappy no matter how much we have. We always seem to want what we don't have, and then we finally get what we want. It's like the song, Is That All There Is? We thought the rockets would go off and life would be totally fulfilling, but then the disappointment came because there was something else missing. Buddha's teaching was to give up desire and thus eliminate suffering. While this is important, it is not the whole message. One of the most important things about accepting where you are right now and enjoying what you already have is that you can have the same peace of mind, the same tranquility, and the same joy right now that you think you will have when you eventually get to where you want to go. This is the most important message. Living in the present doesn't mean that you just accept what you have and cease to create. It simply means that you already have what you want at the being level. At the being level, where you are right now, you are already a success. Most people's lives are about getting something. And the truth is, there's nothing to get. All we have to do is to be. The being produces the end result. It is imperative that you understand that the doing and having parts of your life are not what determine the quality of your life. The being aspect is what determines the quality of your life. Who you are, your conscious perception of yourself being, controls what is happening to you. When you focus your attention on solving problems and trying to make things better, 
something very interesting happens. You miss what you already have. So the only way to find happiness and satisfaction is to enjoy what you have right now. Again, I am not saying that you shouldn't set goals or make plans. What I am saying is that you should enjoy the present moment because this is all you have. Create for tomorrow, but live in and for today. We only have two choices in life. The first is to enjoy what we have today, and the second is to have anxiety about what we don't have and focus on tomorrow, hoping it will be better. There are no other choices. Now remember, getting what you want will not change your life at the being level. So don't let what you have determine who you are, otherwise you will always feel dissatisfied. If you are tied into getting somewhere or getting something to make you happy, you will be on a treadmill for the rest of your life. You will be operating from the hypnotic belief that more is better, and that it is better over there than over here. Go after what you want, but enjoy the trip. Life is a journey, not a destination. Know that when you get what you want, it will not change who you are at the being level. So enjoy yourself, love yourself unconditionally, and participate in the trip. The reward in life does not come from achieving. It comes from participating along the way. Writing your own script means that you are the one who decides what the trip will be about and what the destination will look like. Your intention sets the universe in motion. The universe flows in the direction of your intention, and so it is important to be clear of your exact intention in any situation. If you are absolutely clear as to your intent, your subconscious success mechanism will support you in getting there. Edison, working on all his inventions, always kept in mind where he wanted to arrive, and because he did so, every failure supported his ultimate success. Most people encounter problems in creating the kind of life they want, because they have not clearly determined where they want to go or visualize what it is going to look like when they get there. Those who lead purposeful, successful lives do so because they have set up in their minds a clear picture of what they want to create in their lives. Have you ever wondered why New Year's resolutions don't work? We have such good intentions, but what happens is we often say things like, I'm not going to eat any more sweets. I'm going to stop yelling at the children. I'm going to stop overeating. But the New Year's resolutions were not about what you wanted, but what you didn't want. They were not an image of the end result, but rather a negative reaction, a form of negative self-talk to the present. And this is the reason why so many world problems, business problems, and personal problems persist. The individuals concerned focused on the problem and what they don't want to happen rather than on the end result or the ultimate goal. Goal setting is the key factor that will determine your success or failure in the doing and having portion of your life. Did you ever take a business trip without at least having some idea where you were going? Did you ever play tennis without knowing where the tennis court was? Have you ever left your house to do your weekly shopping without having at least some idea of where you were going to shop? Have you ever taken a holiday without knowing where you wanted to go? Isn't it strange that while the holidays we take merit goals, and the games we play merit goals, and even the shopping we do merits goals, we rarely establish goals for the most important journey of all, our own life. Oh, but you say, I don't want to be pinned down. I want to be spontaneous. I want to be free to change my mind. Well, sometimes we mistakenly think that freedom means avoiding commitment. We fear that if we commit to something, it will own and control us. And so we avoid being the cause of our life and avoid making commitments. We say, I want to be free. But notice how our avoidance of commitment and responsibility keeps everyone around us in prison, not really enslaved, but in confusion, not knowing what they can count on until we make the decisions. In such a relationship, no one can truly win. True freedom actually lies in our ability to make choices and commitments. The question we have to ask ourselves is, what do I really want? Start from the position that, at some level, you absolutely know what you want. At some point, you have to make a decision. Keep this in mind. 
If you don't decide, someone else will decide for you, and their decision may not be what you truly want. You've heard it said that no decision is a decision. Hidden within indecisiveness is the goal of always being right. As long as we don't know what we want, we will never be wrong, never make a mistake, and hence we will never be disappointed. We have been programmed since childhood not to make mistakes. By being indecisive, we can remain a child. The moment we decide to take charge of our lives is the moment we really leave home. Once we start making decisions for ourselves, we are on our own. It is safer not to make decisions, to be passive, childless, and to take our cue from others. Making a decision always reveals something about you. Making a decision tells people who you are. And so, making a decision is essentially divulging a great secret. If your purpose in life is not to reveal who you are, then you will always remain undecided. Another reason for indecisiveness is the fear that we may have to give up something. For example, if you want to take a vacation to Hawaii, it means you have to give up going to the Bahamas at the very same time. To choose one goal means you may have to give up others. If you decide on a certain way, it means you may have to give up other paths. It means you can't be everything, do everything, and have everything at the same time. It means you can't please everybody. When you make a choice, you run the risk of rejecting the values of certain people. They may see you as you really are, not the way they want you to be. In other words, not like them. So by doing nothing, you may be able to retain the love and approval of different people whose values contradict each other, and your indecisiveness helps you to avoid trying to reconcile situations that can't possibly be reconciled. Everything in life is a matter of choice. There are only two things we have no choice about. We cannot avoid these two things no matter how hard we try. The first is that we must die. Death is an absolute certainty. And the second thing we have no choice about is that we must live until we die. Now understand this. Everything else in your life that you think you have to do or are forced to do is a choice. You and I do everything because we choose to do it. We can't change the fact that we are going to die or that we must live until we die. But we can change anything else because everything else is a choice. Look at all the areas of your life and realize you do everything in your life because you choose to do it, not because you have to do it. Remember, the only two things you have no choice about is you have to die and you have to live until you die, period. Look at where you are in your life right now. Where you are is where you want to be. Consciously or unconsciously, you have made a choice. If you want to go anywhere, you must first understand where you are right now. Many people lie to themselves about where they are and they deny their situation in life. But it is absolutely essential that you acknowledge where you are before you can move on. Is your life working the way you want it to? Are you where you would like to be? Do you have the things that you would like to have? If the answer to any of these questions is no, then take a look at your payoff for being where you are. What pleasure do you get out of denying yourself? What pleasure do you get out of being unhappy? What pleasure do you get out of being uncomfortable and not belonging? What pleasure do you get out of thinking in terms of lack and limitation? It is important to remind yourself that everything that you do in life, whether it is positive or negative, is attached to a reward or a payoff. So look at your payoff. Observation is the first step in changing anything. When you observe, you are taking the first step toward freedom. And as you observe, you begin to see your own patterns of thought. You have to tell the truth about where you are before you can move on. If you are in pain, admit it. If something is not working, admit it. This is the fundamental principle of Alcoholics Anonymous. You must first acknowledge that you are an alcoholic before you can recover from alcoholism. So look at where you are right now and then decide where you want to go. Let your mind be open to new possibilities. Remember, at the being level, you are total power and you can create anything that you want. Think about what turns you on. 
When was the last time you really felt turned on? When was the last time you felt enthusiastic or stirred up by something? How about a half a dozen times before that? If you can answer these questions, you have some powerful clues to what you really want. If your response is that you almost never feel turned on, then you are living in denial. When you are free to choose, how do you spend your time? Is there some kind of activity that keeps you interested? Whatever reason that you might give yourself for doing it, you have an important clue as to what you really want to do. On the other hand, if you find yourself in your free time doing nothing but sleeping, daydreaming, or watching television, that is a pretty good sign that you've not allowed yourself to experience what you really want. If you were relieved of all practical considerations, including financial considerations, and if all the possibilities were open to you, what would be the first thing that you would do? What would be the next thing that you would do? What would you do with your life if this happened? This question can be fun because it helps to make your fantasies conscious. Perhaps you even have a fantasy that keeps coming back. Take a look at those fantasies and choose something. You can always change it if you don't like it. You are only committed to it for as long as you want to be committed to it. So make a choice. Start creating what you want in your mind. Have the total experience in mind first. Feel that way, be that way, and imagine it happening just the way you want it to happen. A lot of us are trying to become successful, trying to become happy, or wealthy, or lovable, or to gain something from life that life doesn't presently hold. But we are what we hold, and it comes out of us. Goal setting is simply making choices. It is knowing where you want to go. Said another way, if you don't know where you want to go, you will probably end up someplace else. If we are not achieving what we are capable of achieving, it is because our goals are not clearly defined. Writing our own script means developing a definite workable plan designed to implement action. Your success will be determined largely by your plan of action. Writing your own script also means, quite literally, that your plan should be written down. The kinetic action of writing will further impress your subconscious. Your written plan will give you the courage to follow through and help you to eliminate obstacles, distractions, and interruptions. It will also serve as a yardstick for progress. You will be more aware of how far you have come and how far you have to go. Many psychological studies have shown that a person's motivation is at its highest when he or she has some way of measuring accomplishment. Writing will crystallize thought, and thought motivates action. It reinforces your commitment to the attainment of what you want. It will remind you of your objectives, and each time you review what you have written, you will be reminded of what you want and why you want it. You will be greatly rewarded for doing this. Also, you will conserve time and energy because you will always know where you have been, where you are, and where you are going. And when obstacles get in your way, your written plan will help you to reevaluate and get back on track. Freud said that goals cause frustration and anxiety, and he was against the establishment of specific goals. Viktor Frankl, on the other hand, said that we cannot live without goals because man's basic nature is to be goal oriented. As far as I am concerned, they are both right. The biggest mistake that people make is aiming too high or accepting too much too soon. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have it all. I'm merely suggesting that if you are going to be a tennis champ, it might be a good idea to first learn how to hold the racket and hit the ball across the net. So goals are not promises, but commitments. They are not wishes, but visions. We do not hope our dreams are going to find us. We find them. Goals don't start in our brain, they start in our heart. We are not going to be committed to our goal 100% until we are clear on the benefits. This is probably the most important and significant step in goal setting. If you are working in a job, or you are in a relationship with someone, or if you are expending any effort in your life and are not sure of the benefits you will obtain, you will have greater difficulty maintaining the necessary enthusiasm, persistence, and dedication. When you are not sure of the benefits, it is very difficult to dedicate yourself to something. 
Goal setting helps you to specifically identify the benefits that you will receive from the efforts you expend. You will not be able to hold a high degree of commitment towards the accomplishment of anything unless you are absolutely clear on the benefits. As you progress in goal setting and begin handling harder and more complex projects, it is essential that you understand why you want to accomplish that specific goal. Psychology teaches there are only two reasons for any of us to do anything. One is to gain benefits and the other is to avoid losses. If you are clear on the benefits, you will be willing to pay the price. The critical difference between those who make it and those who don't is desire. Rewards create desire. So spend a lot of time outlining benefits and rewards. A goal can be defined as something that has an inherent or built-in reward upon its achievement. If your goal has no inherent reward, you do not have a goal. If your written plan does not clearly set the benefits and the rewards that come upon the attainment of the goal, you will miss the most important ingredient, a motivation to action. No reward, no action. You can solve any problem in life by saying what you want, the specific end result. As soon as you say what you want, the first thing that you are going to experience is the feeling that it can't be done. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how it is going to work. I feel helpless. Who is going to help me? Where am I going to get the money? What if this doesn't work? What if I fail? This is your subconscious mind trying to protect you from an imaginary loss. When you say you want to do something, everything unlike it will come up for you to evaluate and defuse. All your fears and doubts will surface. If you will center your thoughts on what you want to happen, which is the goal, instead of what you don't want to happen, which is the obstacle, you will overcome this negative feedback. The successful accomplishment of any task is determined at the being level prior to the actual beginning of the task. In other words, believing that you can do it before you do it. We cannot sustain a mental image of a goal that is inconsistent with our beliefs. Be realistic about the possible obstacles and roadblocks. Ask yourself, what circumstances or conditions may prevent me from achieving this goal? Your answer to that will outline what you will have to overcome to obtain what you want. Some of the obstacles and roadblocks may be simple. Some may be more complex. Many people do not do this because they think it is negative to focus on obstacles and roadblocks. But it is important to understand that you won't get where you are going until you know who or what is standing in the way of your achieving your goal. So write them down and make a list as complete as possible. Some of the obstacles will just take care of themselves without your attention. The biggest mistake people make in goal setting, however, is to gloss over roadblocks and obstacles that should be recognized before they get started toward their goals. You may not be aware of them all, but the more prepared you are, the easier it will be to handle them. As you complete this process, the natural tendency will be to become a little discouraged and perhaps you will lose some of your enthusiasm. You might start to focus on all the effort necessary to overcome your obstacles and roadblocks. If this happens, stop for a few moments and go back over the benefits. Know that what you want is worth the obstacles that may have to be handled along the way and then get started. Know in your mind that you always have the choice to stop or to continue with your plan. You can change your mind at any time you want. But for the moment, the important thing is to get started. Don't get locked up into the ultimate goal. Just concentrate on the next step. Take it one step at a time. Most people become overwhelmed by the overall goal and give up. Use the overall goal as a point of reference, but concentrate on the steps. The one step at a time principle is important in achieving goals. Even the largest goals are obtained one step at a time. Once you are aware of the obstacles, you will find the awareness alone will go a long way toward finding the solution because knowledge is power. The solutions and cost of overcoming the obstacles will become quite obvious. For every obstacle there is a solution, and the solution is always available because the answers are with us.
You do not have to look outside of yourself for the answer. If you know this, you will be guided to the right person, the right place, the right book, or the right situation that will help you to overcome your obstacles. Develop this belief system. I know what I need to know. You know what to do and you know how to do it because your higher self or internal guidance system will guide you every step of the way. All you have to do is be open, responsive, and receptive to the answers. In doing so, you will cease to see obstacles as limitations because you will know that who you are is greater than any obstacle. When you combine your wants, benefits, obstacles, and solutions together in writing, you will gain a tremendous feeling of power and excitement. It will also help you to see that most of your limitations are self-imposed. Timing is also an important factor in the achievement of any goal. Parkinson's Law states that work will expand to fill the time allotted for it. For this reason, among others, we have to have a time frame or time limit on our endeavors. Unfortunately, this is one of the steps that most people consciously or unconsciously delete from their plan of action. A deadline for action is of the utmost importance. It is the essential activating mechanism. When you set a deadline for the accomplishment of a goal, not only do you act on the deadline, but also the deadline acts on you. So any goal must state a specific date upon which it will be accomplished. Therefore, a statement such as, I hope to lose 20 pounds during the next six months, should be revised to state, I will weigh exactly blank number of pounds on or before whatever the date is. This statement says exactly what you are going to accomplish and when you are going to accomplish it. It doesn't emphasize the loss of something, but rather the attainment of a specific goal, the weight of X number of pounds. If you work within a time frame, your thinking, action, and reaction will be more precise, and you will act with more urgency. It will enable you to eliminate distractions, think more clearly, and be more creative. The reason for this is simple. You won't have time to worry about non-essential activity. Balance is important when working with deadlines. Your deadline should be the slave, not the master. If through some unforeseen circumstances your deadline is delayed or has to be changed, just relax, readjust, and reset the deadline. There will be times when you may have temporary setbacks, but learn to distinguish a setback from a defeat. A setback is temporary. A defeat is permanent. If you are willing to handle the setback, you will not have to be concerned about the defeat. Most people do not successfully implement goal setting because they do not weigh up the benefits, rewards, obstacles, solutions, and cost. If you will commit yourself to working through all of those steps, you will stay on track, and you won't get overwhelmed by the size or the details necessary to your goal's achievement. You will learn to keep your attention on the specific steps that, when put together, will allow you to achieve the entire goal. A primary factor in the successful use of goals is positive feedback. Without positive feedback, you will not continue to use goals. So always keep a list of the goals that you accomplish, including the obstacles you overcome along the way. Buy a special notebook for this purpose and refer to it often. As you complete your goals, file your written worksheets in the back of your notebook and review them periodically. Keep adding to your list of accomplished goals. Every time that you look at this list, you will gain further confidence in your ability to obtain what you want through the process we've just discussed. On the surface, this may seem like a lot of extra work and effort. However, I can tell you it is a lot more work and effort to go through life not having the things you really want. Do not be fooled by the simplicity of this process and do not underestimate the power behind it. To do this would be to sabotage your own potential. Writing your own